Hello, everyone. Let's get started, and I'll, I'll try to figure out as as we as we go. Thank you all. It's your choice to leave your camera on or not. Uh, for now, when we get started with uh, Miret and Pilar, I'm going to mute you all just so it doesn't get confused for for going around. My name, my name is Lili Vieira de Carvalho. I'm the executive director of the Vancouver Latin American Cultural Center, VLAC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all. I, I would like to acknowledge that we are zooming in from the uh, unceded territory, uh, territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisley, what mm -hmm. peoples where we are un uninvited guests. You might be in in other areas, um, and we are we are even uh, talking that we might have some people uh, zooming in from from Brazil and some other countries. Oh, Colombia just coming in right now. Uh, we are so happy to be presenting this series. This is the first of four studio visits for the time being, and if this uh, and and we are counting on your feedback to make this even better and hopefully to keep on with the, the, the studio visits into 2021. Uh, a little uh, uh, bit of housekeeping. This event is being recorded and we can send you the link uh, if, you do, you, if, you do, uh, if you so desire. Uh, we are trying to live stream it to Facebook, but having a little bit of a technical problem, but let's see if we can pull this off. We are going to have a little Q&A at the end of the presentation. So we'll have enough time for your questions. So if the questions come up while you, uh, while you are during the presentation, you can write them on the, on the chat and I will be paying attention to that and present your questions uh, at the very end. You are all also going to see uh, a little poll pop up very soon, uh, just with the one question. So please uh, mark the, the, the answer. Uh, tomorrow or the maximum, the day after tomorrow, uh, through the Eventbrite link, you are going to receive uh, like a five minute survey just to help us uh, uh, improve these presentations. So uh, please, if you be so kind to, to answer that, we would really appreciate that. So without further uh, ado, um, I would like to present the co-founder of Curated Tastes, Mirette Rodri Rodriguez, and she will be presenting Pilar. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and for having both uh, Pilar and I as part of your program. Also welcome everyone that is joining us through Zoom and hopefully watching this uh, as a sort of replay through Facebook for being here with us today. Um, well, really, first of all, I would just like to share um, my story of how I came across Pilar's work. And afterwards, we will continue and transition into a live uh, interview with Pilar, who is uh, in your screen. She's also here. Hi, Pilar. And um, really, um, just as an art historian, it's really hard for me to talk about art without talking about the story surrounding the art, because I believe this is actually uh, one of the very uh, fascinating characteristics uh, about the life in and around art. And about um, 13 years ago, as a Mexican teenager who left uh, her country pursuing the adventure of life or something, I was looking for something, I never really gave much thought to the uh, process of leaving my culture uh, behind or fighting time to, to preserve it. And uh, along the way, along this journey of becoming this uh, attempt of a young adult, I found a refuge in the way that artists attempt to make sense of this complicated yet simple uh, world, especially about these uh, very peculiar feeling of loss and cultural assimilation. I recognize that I'm not the only one um, that feels this way in this pursuit. And I feel that speaking about these feelings are going to be beneficial to the many of us uh, tuning in today. 
I can imagine that the vast majority of us here um, feel this to some degree. And this is especially the case with Pilar and the three other artists that are participating in the series. And now I, I first came across Pilar's work uh, during the East Side Culture Crawl last year. I actually oh, yeah. remember, sorry, I think I heard someone there. Um, so I actually remember how last year during the East Side Culture Crawl, I came into uh, Pilar's studio and with my mother who was visiting at the time. And I was drawn to this um, deep blue canvas that was at the kind of like at the backing uh, of her studio. And I was just drawn to these figures that were half, half human, half fish, half bird. And I just remember being just so um, pulled by her work. And, and I felt this sort of recognition in the way that uh, Pilar, I guess, processed as well, the, the process of, of moving uh, away from, a, from your country of origin and becoming this some sort of hybrid as well. And um, just before the call began, I, I was sharing with uh, Pilar and Lily that I, um, I actually, that day I saw Pilar being engulfed by a, a group of people. Um, Pilar was sharing uh, stories about, about her work with the people and I didn't want to bother, so I didn't approach her that day. Um, but I remember above all what I was, what really caught my attention is how the people that were speaking to Pilar just felt this sort of empathy and connection to her personal story. And I think that goes, that is really well transmitted through her work. So I'm just really happy that uh, Pilar, you're sharing your work with us today as well. Um, but anyways, we're not here to talk about me or my story. We're actually here because we're all curious to see how Pilar being an artist from uh, Bolivia, from being an immigrant, some sort of Bolivian transplant here. We're here to see how she uh, lived that process and how she uses her work. She uses uh, painting, sculpture, and drawing to, to digest and, and, and process these changes. Um, so without further ado, I am going to go ahead and share my screen with you so that um, we can as well uh, get an idea of the visuals that I am speaking about. I guess I'll make a brief pause just to mention that, as I, as I said before, we are sharing the uh, four viewpoints of four different artists based in Vancouver, and today is our first session with Pilar. This is a painting um, that I referred to in the beginning of the call. Um, and I'm wondering if everyone is seeing my screen fine. Can someone just go like this? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. So quite a, an enigmatic uh, piece. And uh, I, I actually, I guess it's interesting how, what I remember is the, the, the blue, right? Seeing the, the piece again, there is more detail to it, but I do remember just being called into this sort of, um, sort of universe. We will be speaking about these pieces as well, but just to sort of share the, the beauty and the magic behind her works. And so, Pilar, in your, um, in your artist statement, you say that the universal human experience of moving across lands, and for the most part, unknowingly crossing paths with animal migration piques your curiosity. You also say that your work explores ideas of immigration and migration, both human and animal. Anthropomorphic forms, such as the anthrofish figure, this half-human, half-fish uh, being, and recently the ornithrop, the half-human and half-bird figure. They are examples of vessels in drawing and painting, in sculpture and mixed media. And you also say that you use these um, to explore the transformative effects of migration on yourself and to construct metaphorical narratives around these themes. So Pilar, could you please tell us more about where this construction of anthropomorphic figures comes from? And I will unmute you because perhaps you, um, or perhaps I can ask Lily to help me unmute Pilar. Hi, I think I'm unmuted now, yes? Yes, we can hear you. 
my camera around because the sunset is really starting to impact my <laughs> my computer I, i'm just looking at it and okay i think this is a little bit better um let me know if, if i'm totally invisible on the screen um thank you so much for having me in this series i really um, i'm very humbled by it uh and i'm very excited about it i'm, I'm actually looking forward to um uh, learning about the other artists that you're going to be featuring in this show and this program as well. Um, it's 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 uh, difficult to figure out where to begin um, and where I began with the construction of these figures. I guess my constant interest in the, in Greek mythology um, has always guided my my work in some ways and i have been juxtaposing animal and human uh, vegetable and human um you know i've i've been playing with those ideas for a really long time and one that really struck me uh was when i arrived at the fish the salmon and the human figure that really seemed to pull me um into wanting to explore it really um thoroughly in in whatever ways i i found interesting and um i like the idea of the legs showing and the the type of costume being on top because i think it's because growing up i saw a lot of costumes um in bolivia uh we have the carnaval of course and there would be a lot of dancers on the streets uh these comparsas like what you're seeing right now where people wear these incredible and uh, very de detailed costumes, but you can always see their legs. So when I was little and growing up, I would see lots of legs and then these beautiful ornate costumes on top. So I think that's kind of where the, the idea of uh, the half human in in the, the lower portion the legs and then the the costume on top came from it it seemed like a natural vocabulary to me um and i think that would be my most basic answer in terms of where the construction of of the half human half uh, animal comes from in terms of the subject matter um that's it's a it's very diverse and that's what's so wonderful about it is that I can explore all sorts of different combinations. And uh, here, what I see is, of course, when I was experimenting with animal legs and human uh, torsos, which is um, something I did for, for a small while, and then I stuck to the, to the other way around. That seemed to stick more, because when I was using human legs, um, it seemed to invite the idea of sculpture. And so um, my drawings and my paintings became three-dimensional through that exploration. Thank you, Pilar. So, yeah, so here we're looking at uh, works of yours that are a little bit earlier in time. And I remember um, speaking to you about um, the pavement, fish and flies uh, painting. And I just thought it was uh, such an interesting way to, 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 to process the, these kinds of uh, maybe cultural shocks um, or these kind of uh, situations that you saw when you, when you moved to Vancouver. Do you mind telling us a little bit more yes. um, about the process of this painting? Sure. Um, so we had moved into this townhouse. Um, this was, I think when I, just a few years after I moved to Vancouver, um, our, our living room window faced the alley. And what I didn't realize is that this, this was a very, very busy alley. And there were lots of people coming and going um, and just all the dumpsters would basically be turned inside out and dug through and stuff would be taken out. And anyways, it was, uh, at first it was really, um, I found it kind of off-putting. And later on, as time went by, um, I, I decided or I, I started to feel attracted to, to who these people were. 
And so I started talk, talking to some of them and, uh, you know, I became friendly with some of them. And, and so they took on a very human uh, form in front of my eyes because at first they had been hidden. I, I had made assumptions about their lives. I had made assumptions about who they were and why they were doing what they were doing. Um, so I think this painting, uh, Pavements for Flies, kind of reflects that kind of um, the journey that I took, if you will, or that life gave me about the, the, the alley dweller that goes into your dumpster and picks stuff out and uh, you know, finds their treasures in there. Um, and this painting is, uh, is one way of, of interpreting that, I guess, because they seemed invisible and they seemed uh, one way in the alley, but then one-on-one -on -one they become very much humans, of course. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of a reaction to that experience that I had in that particular alley. I had also uh, said that I was really interested in at the time of, uh, of painting human flesh. And I was, I don't know why I had this thing about flies. So I really wanted to paint a really detailed fly. So I painted one on his shoulder. <laughs> yes, I love that. Uh, something that I, I forgot to mention um, in your introduction when I first saw your work is that when I, I saw you um, looking into the life, life cycle of salmon, I just thought it was fascinating how you were able to um, kind of really grasp the com the concept of decay and transformation. So I guess maybe it's something that was, you know, in a very early stage in, in your work somehow, because it's part of the cycle, right? Uh, the composition. Yeah. Yeah, I think I always kind of, uh, I'm in between that, uh, the, the, the transformation and the decay as you described because there is that transformation brings on life if there is a, a, a resurrection if you will of either on in your part or the other um, depending on, on on the subject and i think for in this particular one um, the, the new life was mine because it opened my mind and my heart to see other people as humans in a, if, if I were to put it in a rough way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is lovely. With the salmon, um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, when I moved to the uh, Pacific Northwest, I found um, that salmon were, of course, emblematic in this area. And I started to um, figure, you know, to kind of figure out who these, these fish were. And when I found out how dependent we are on, on their lives and on their health and how they give us the force that we have, how they, through their cycle of life, um, bring us everything that we have in the, in the Pacific West, like the forests, the all of the, the incredible nature that we enjoy, um, partly and not a small part, a large part of it is because of salmon and how salmon parts, if you will, if you will are distributed throughout the forests from the skin to, the, to what flies themselves pick up off of the uh, decayed salmon that bears abandon, um, and then they fly around the forest, well, if, if a bug eats them or if they just fall dead, they kind of sprinkle little nutrients of salmon throughout the forest, and that's what gives more life to the forest, which I found absolutely fantastic that a fish or a group of fish can make such a huge difference to our, to our environment. Yes, yes, and um, so I also, I guess on that note, I also wanted to to take the opportunity to ask how how it was for you um, when you came to Canada and you learned about this fascinating cycle. How did you, how did that connect with you? How did that connect with your own movement uh, from Bolivia to um, Whitehorse? Uh, well, 
the first thing I noticed, well, one of the first thing I noticed when I, I moved to BC were the trees, because the trees here are fabulous. And in La Paz, we don't have very many trees because we're at 4,000 or 3,600 3, uh, meters above sea level. We get eucalyptus and small trees, but nothing like the enormous trees that we have here. So it was a shock. It was a beautiful shock. <laughs> that was a be very beautiful shock. But what uh, we moved to Whitehorse when I was 12, um, and it was winter, and that was a shock. Uh, but that was a, a snow-covered shock in the Yukon. Um, and that kind of, um, I guess it's a, it is a transplant. You don't think about that when you're a kid, of course, because I was with my parents, I was with my sister. So it didn't really, really sink in until later on. Um, what a different society, what different culture I was in. And of course, when you're small enough, of course, you absorb everything like a sponge. So I was fortunate that I was able to learn the language pretty quickly and kind of absorb the culture as well, even though uh, I missed home a lot. Um, and and that started to come out for me in my painting a lot in university, which was funny because I was painting all sorts of things that in Bolivia I would have I, I wasn't really interested in painting, but because I was missing home without really realizing how much I was missing home, I started painting these um, you know llamas and cholitas and all sorts of very folkloric. Uh, individuals in my paintings that made my paintings uh, seem kind of nostalgic or like postcards for Bolivia <laughs> and that in university well that just doesn't fly <laughs> but anyways that, that's a whole other matter <laughs> anyways eventually I uh, you know I when you when you when you're living that moment, you don't realize how that's shaping you. But later on, that coupled with experience and being able to absorb uh, the experiences that you are uh, presented with. And uh, as an artist, of course, you're always absorbing information. You're always absorbing experiences and you're channeling these things onto your canvas, onto your artwork. So um, with time and experience, those cholitas and the llamas got refined <laughs> and my, the evolution of my work uh, was, you know, it, it's a full range of things from nostalgic to uh, kind of this magical realist, I don't know what to call it really to whatever it is now, I don't like to label my work, so I'm not gonna call it anything. I just call it narrative because it, it contains my story. It's more of, I think it's an autobiographical uh, portrait really because uh, it tells a lot about my life, but in, in just symbols and, and vocabulary that is familiar to me and maybe my family members. So thank you for that. On, on that note, actually, I, I had another question for you. And I think this is just part of me trying to understand, uh, you know, if we actually lose a part of ourselves when we leave our countries or do we gain something or do we become this sort of hybrid? And when I, when I heard your story and when I look at your work and I think of so many uh, immigrants and migrants that, that live in Canada and I look at, for example, these um, salmon, uh, it just, it, you know, one of it is losing its scales, the other one sort of carrying a burning house. And I was just wondering if you, if those thoughts um, are ever conscious maybe on you of, of that part of, of losing, but gaining, um, carrying heritage, uh -huh. what, what is that like for you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, the thing is about, uh, about artwork, thankfully, is that you're not purposely trying to, at least I'm not, trying to tell a story by forcing an image on a canvas. It's usually, um, I'll draw something, I'll paint something that'll give me a different idea and I'll pursue that. And then upon reflection, can I see what was happening? 
Um, but in terms of the salmon, I found that they are, of course, migratory uh, beings. And I'm a migratory being. Um, and off COVID times, I go home every year. So I have an annual migration of my own. So I was able to kind of look at my life through the parallels of salmon migrations because um, they go off to sea for a few years and then they come back to the place where they were born. And that's what a lot of migrants do, um, or immigrants, I guess I should say, is that we, we live, we're experiencing um, our lives, but our hearts or this kind of instinct kicks in and then you want to go visit home. You want to go kind of fill up that part of yourself um, with the language, the culture, things that you miss, your, your melancholy bones get uh, satisfied and then you come back. But for me, it started becoming both ways because I moved to Canada, I guess, so young. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm a, a pretty much half and half. When I'm in Bolivia, I start missing Canada. When I'm in Canada, I miss Bolivia. So it's like I'm never quite, I'm somewhere in between. Um, and I think like the, the work that you have on the screen right now uh, kind of reflects that idea of, of a journey. You don't see the background. It's mostly about the journey than it is about where you're, where you are. Um, I kind of see that that way. And then um, the birds are, have the same idea, the ornithropes. They're the cliff swallows that migrate every year um, from North America to South America. So I purposely pursued them because that's what they do. They, uh, they are a bird that migrates to South America. Both of these, I think, are, are more fun explorations for me because with, with time and experience, you realize too that you are, you're more than just a, a person that came from somewhere and arrived somewhere else. You're not A or B, you're, you're a spirit. You're, you're a spiritual being who has a body that's experiencing things. So I think the, the idea of missing home for me fortunately has transformed into, um, you know, uh, kind of seeing your life as an enrichment of your, your spirit being enriched by these experiences so that you can see your life as a, as a journey um, that, that makes who you are. But you don't necessarily, I don't think anyways, that we can be defined only by by where we're from because we're we're a spirit we're not you know only body our bodies are vessels our spirits are are something else above all of that yes i, I really like this uh, vision and how you use these uh, anthropomorphic beings as these uh, vessels and uh, about the birds, I actually did have a question. So um, the notion of the salmon, I think it's uh, maybe familiar to many of us uh, living in Vancouver, but for the bird, can you tell us a little bit more what type of bird this is and how you, um, I guess, um, process that, that movement of this bird? The movement of, sorry, I, you cut off a little bit. Oh, sorry. I was um, just wondering if you could tell us more about the type of bird that uh, you depict and what it is like for what, what kind of movement does this bird have and how did that come into your into your narrative, into your uh, visuals? Yeah, because I had explored the water with the salmon, I started looking to the sky uh, for a creature that I could find, um, you know, a parallel journey with. And after a bit of exploration, I found that the cliff swallow has that kind of migration movement uh, that's similar to mine. And so I uh, started looking at it and I found it was quite the, it's, it's just a little bird, but boy, does it, can it travel, you know, really far. And that's a good one with the two <laughs> uh, treatments of both. 
And so I, um, I latched myself onto the cliff swallow because I found it a fascinating creature that has similar migration paths than I do. And, um, and so then I, I have the air and I have water. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what will be next, we'll see. Um, but I'm still, I'm still quite fascinated by the cliff swallow. So I'm, I'm still exploring its, um, its richness. Yeah, and especially in sculpture right now, I was supposed to have an exhibition in Bolivia in June this year, and I was gonna have 28 sculptures here, I'll show you. I don't know if everybody can see this little guy. Here. So I stopped so sharing so that hopefully we can see your screen bigger. Is that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, so you can see they're not very large because I wanted to keep them somewhat in the scale of, of the bird. Um, and they're made of resin and uh, bronze powder. And the wings are mixed media. So they're wire mesh and papers that I've, uh, treated with gels and acrylics. They're pattern paper in terms of the paper aspect, because I always like to use pattern paper for its translucency. Um, anyway, so uh, I was gonna make 28 of them. I don't quite have 28 right now, <laughs> but it's still the goal. Um, and unfortunately, of course, because of COVID, it got canceled. Um, so I still have these, I have that one project still, um, on the go for whenever I can I can make the journey but yeah so I'm still quite interested in them and uh, exploring different poses for them so that one's resin this one is um, this one is plaster it's much lighter and they're all going to be on plinths and in different poses. Um, so I was really looking forward to that. But uh, anyway, so it's a project that I'm still working on in amongst all the other stuff. Wonderful. So that was actually my, my next question. I was going to ask what you were working on. And if with that, we could segue into uh, transitioning into this uh, virtual studio visit. Since you have mm -hmm. you have us to the screen and just wondering, um, yeah, what else what else are you working on? You're maybe working on different projects at the same time. Uh, yeah, I um. So I'll. Uh, just, sorry if I get everybody dizzy. <laughs> um, I guess I have to go a bit this way. So there's two paintings there, Mira, that's the one that you liked. Um, <laughs> but then right next to it is another one that I'm working on that's, uh, that's a bit of an experiment because it's uh, like a fish lady talking to a bird lady. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's, it's in progress. It's not finished by any means. So that's one work that I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by right now. Um, then I've got, oh, there's my husband hiding. Uh, Your agent. <laughs> there is a commission that I'm on. Uh, you can see it there. I've just started the underpainting today. So that's going into somebody's lovely house in, on Bowen Island. Um, let's see, what, what else can I show you? Just gonna make sure that I don't lose you. Uh, that's very sunny over there, so I can I'd also see. just like to um, let there. everyone know, in case they don't know yet, that you can choose your view. So you can do gallery view uh, or speaker view, and you can choose which one works best for you to see the to see Pilar Studio and, and a fuller screen. Can I just uh, hop out for just one second? I'm going to make sure that the hotspot is working so I don't lose the connection while I'm walking around with my iPad. I'll be two seconds. Of course. No problem. Thank you.
That's fascinating. I'm loving this. <laughs> I, uh, and I was going to say that too. I think it's better if we can, uh, and whenever, uh, Emirat, whenever you talk, then it goes to you if we are on the, which is fine, but whenever she's showing, uh, showing work. I'm very curious about the materials she, she uses. I think that's something that, that I'm going to say uh, for, for. Yes, and um, please, uh, whoever is no having any questions ever. already, type them in the chat or we can wait until the Q&A, but don't, don't hold back. We're here to ask questions and to, to learn more about uh, Pilar's practice. Okay. I should be back, yes. <laughs> okay, I am on the hotspot now, so I should not lose you at all. So I'm just gonna show you my um, sculpture table. Let me just see. What's that? So, um, <laughs> look at my, sorry, I, I'm not an expert at this. <laughs> Oh, I can show you a failed figure. So this guy, uh, where is he? That's a, a clay piece that I worked on. It was one of the first birds that I did. And I was working with uh, uh, this armature wire that uh, kind of rusted and this clay kind of fell apart. So that was before I figured out that oil clay is a whole lot better to work with. Um, then I have um, some pieces that I, like the pieces that I was working for the show that are not complete. So this is an incomplete bird, if you will. Um, and you can see the holes in the back. They're where the wings go. I hope this is interesting. <laughs> I can just talk and talk. Um, it's super here interesting. Are, here are, uh oh, where are you? Where's the camera? There you go. Uh, here's one of the wings that's loose. And I also have this sitting bird figure, or kneeling, sorry. So he's kneeling. Let me replace. Gosh, is everybody dizzy yet? Uh, let's see this guy that's kneeling. Because he only has one wing right now oh, and it's about to fall because it's just being placed until I, it's not um, permanent yet. I'm just still playing with the, with the positions and that's why it's falling, but um, it will have two wings eventually. Oh, have I lost you? I don't know where it is. Oh, there we go. Anyway, so that's that one. Bye-bye. Uh, let me see. I can take you. Here's the ladies that will soon be painted at some point. Um, this is the desk area. Can you see that? In my studio, you can see one of the fish there. Is that visible? Uh, maybe not. I'll take you to the fish. <laughs> Uh, where is it? Uh oh, sorry guys. I'm not a very good camera person. Here we go. There's the fish. So there's the fish and its little tail. Little eggies. <laughs> I don't know what else to show you. What else would be fascinating? Um, this is my messy table. This is where I do, like, I'll just do some research with, uh, with materials, my cutouts, all sorts of cutouts for collages. Um, this is a costume that I'm working on. If you can see it. This has little houses on top of it. Nothing is permanent right now, so I can't touch it. Um, then there's another sculpture there. <laughs> Any questions? I don't know what else to show you. <laughs> I think we are all enjoying this a lot, and I think uh, many of us have questions. So, yeah, if... can I jump in and ask a couple of questions? Yes. Uh, 
Well, we have a couple of questions here. Do we have a favorite place to work in the studio? Maybe there is a special inspiration. Yeah, uh, this one here. Um, you can see my palette. So I have a palette table there. I don't know if everybody can see that. Can you see that? One that I roll around, it's got wheels on it. And so this is the area where I paint. So I'll stand here and paint. And there's my painting travel table. It's got all my paints and all my brushes. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, this seems to be my favorite spot. So Pilar, I was curious I don't know. about... Um, hmm. About because it seems to me that you that you move uh, uh, among different materials. You go from painting to sculpture to but I, I'm seeing clay and I'm seeing. Mm. Uh, you know what I was wondering if you ever try to actually use actual feathers and actual uh, fish scales. Have you tried to use actual uh, like? <laughs> No, um, I don't know if I could use fish scales. That would be really weird. But I do, somebody did give me um, kind of the, they're fish skins, but they're leather. Like they, I don't know if it's, no, I think it is the fish skins, but they, they've made it kind of into leather. Um, I still have to find something to use. For that, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll find something. Maybe it's like skin, no? um, skin that is dried out and ma made as as. Uh, yeah, but they made it into some sort of leather. It's really interesting stuff. Right now, I couldn't tell you where it is. It's, it's actually like salmon, salmon skin. Yeah, it's an actual skin, but it's um, it's quite flexible. Um, Anyways, uh, but I, I don't know what use I will have for it. I, I love to work with paper. Mm -hmm. Paper is my favorite thing. I just love paper in all sh shapes, forms. and um, Natural materials are trickier. Like I will put real feathers into the costumes, of course, of the fish. Um, lots of fish have real feathers in, in the costumes. Mm -hmm. um, in but other than that, I'll, I'll probably uh, replicate most things with paper. So, uh, because I love to build with the paper, so I'll make the paper look like whatever it is that I need to have it look like. Another thing that occurred to me while I was seeing your work is uh, we, uh, at VLAC, we have a Latin American short stories reading group where we read short stories in America. And, and there is a story from, from Gabriel Garcia Marquez that is uh, an old man with, it's, I think it's called an old man with very long wings. Do you know that story? The angel that fell into a patio? Yes. The old, I love that story. What is, the, um, I it's, can't remember the title right now, but I absolutely love that story. Yeah, I, I really like his yes. work. I mean, yes. He's, and Magical so, realism. Yes, yeah, Your work does touch that uh, uh, um, magical realism. All this, this thing that happens in between real life and a, a dream life. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. a, a life that happens in the dreams. A, a life of fantasy. I think it's, uh, it's interesting because... Um, I remember sitting around the dining room table after dinner or tea, whatever it was, and my grandmother would start telling these wonderful stories of yesteryear, of her times when she was young. And very often she would intertwine things that, that were magical, like things that nobody could understand. Or she would tell us like legends of um, Potosi or, or things that had happened in La Paz that were completely unexplained. Like for example, um, I guess there had been a tragedy and uh, a couple had died before 
they got married or something like that. And so the, the town had come together to support the families. And on the day of the burial, because they were going to have the burial for both people on the same day, uh, the hearse was being pulled by horses. This was back in the day. And his hearse was going first, I believe. And at one point, the horses stopped moving. And they just would not move at all. They would not continue the road. And it was so long, um, and the horses would move, that they started to see the other hearse coming by. And that was hers. And so the horses waited until she caught up to them. And then they started walking together. You know, things like that, that you think um, they're... Could they be real? I don't know if they actually happened, but my grandmother told them like they had happened yesterday. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that's magical realist in the fact that they're just stories that contain a lot of unbelievable things that make your imagination run wild. And uh, you look for those things when you're little, when you're growing up and, and you look for that magic happening all around you. Um, when you hear them in family stories. True, and then in the, in the tradition of the Latin American magical realism, we always have animals and animals that stand for, for something. Uh, and we, I, I just looked it up, it's called A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings. It, it has a mm -hmm. subtitle that says, Tale for Children. And it's just weird because it's just mm -hmm. like, it's a very spooky story that's not something that you would uh, because it's the story of this old man with wings that shows up and, and they, they, they put him in the, in the chicken coop. Uh, and That's the, right. the whole neighborhood starts visiting the family that has this old man that's kind of part an angel. But it, he's like old and smelly and like a, uh, like a bum. He's not like an angel at all. He's not a uh, glamorized uh, idea of an angel. He's like, I believe his wings are also kind of falling apart. And wings are falling apart. Not quite. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, I love I'm kind of asking uh, stories. But if anybody wants to jump in and wants to unmute, I would welcome you to, to do so then you can be part of the conversation and I don't feel so, mo so lonely. <laughs> can, I, can I say something? Sure, please, Jimena. Uh, <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jimena Navarro and I'm from Bolivia too. And I met Pilar many, many years ago, I would say uh, 25 years ago. And I remember going to her house and the your studio looked like your house in Bolivia and I remember I love it I remember your paintbrushes I remember your uh, it's almost the same and okay. uh, I remember your cats and I'm, I'm yeah and you don't you don't paint your cats and I remember I think it was your one of your favorite animals so you're right Hate the cats, <laughs> yeah. and I have one. Like I have him, I'll I'll see him lying down or something, and I'll do quick sketches. But I've never actually done any completed paintings with cats. And I, <laughs> I love, guess. yeah, uh -huh. I love the. Um, um, do you also go to like to talk with um, with the students in school? Do you do something like that? Because it's amazing the way that you uh, paint and inspire you, your story of moving to, to Canada. Do you work with students or things like that to share that? It will be really amazing. Oh, you know, uh, I have worked with kids for sure. I've never really told my story. Um, Maybe I should, uh, maybe entertain them while they're That's painting. That's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I will. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, actually. It's so nice to see you, Jimena. It's nice so to see you, Pilar. I know. <laughs> we should connect. <laughs> yeah, we should. We should. 
this is great. I, I would have never imagined that I would reconnect with uh, friends from from Bolivia through Zoom in yeah. Vancouver. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> that is so lovely. Yeah, really Thank you so much for you. joining this call. And Thank lovely. you. So Pilar, we have a, another question in the chat. Uh, the question says, uh, you mentioned spirituality and humans living an experience to transcend, using their bodies as vessels. Do you believe in past lives? Have you considered incorporating that subject in your work? Oh, um, you know, I used to believe in past lives, but I don't anymore. Um, I mean, we could get into a whole discussion on, on religion, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think at some point, you know, I, I've lived a long life now because I can't remember when I did what. Uh, I used to be able to say five years ago, I did this, 10 years ago, I did that. But now it's just the one big mess in my head. Um, but I think at some point I did explore that idea. I remember reading some books on it. Um, and finding the ideas fascinating. Um, but that was, I think, was probably in my 20s or something like that when I was exploring that. Um, but nevertheless, I think um, our bodies are vessels. I mean, they're, we are spirit and terrible things can happen to our bodies and do happen to our bodies. Um, so there has to be something that remains. You know, if the body is, is destroyed in one way or another, um, then our spirit is untouched. And that's the wonderful thing. Um, our spirit is still there um, and moving on to um, their place of, of home, right? To the, to the ultimate home. Um, that's how I see death anyway, is going back home. Um, so I... I haven't actually, um, maybe, I don't know if I do or if I don't reflect those ideas in my work, but uh, they're definitely great ideas for exploration. So one has to live a really long life so you can explore all these things with your work. <laughs> Hopefully we all live really long lives here. <laughs> um, <I'm... laughs> So um, actually, Pilar, I think I'm just going to like um, use this space to make another question of my own, <laughs> because um, I think we, we spoke briefly about how you moved here um, from Bolivia to Whitehorse. Uh, I'm not sure we spoke about your experience of coming uh, in the middle of winter. And I also would like to talk a little bit about the, um, the adaptations that you had to go through artistically. Uh, for example, um, maybe giving up a little bit of color uh, as being, you know, as kind of mm -hmm. adapting to to the North American culture, which maybe uh, maybe in Vancouver we're used to like muted col muted colors versus like really warm colors. So, one thing yes. if you could share a little bit about that. Okay. Um, sorry, was there a first question before that? Yes, I totally placed two questions in there. The first Moving question. To <laughs> Maybe we talk about the color. <laughs> sure. Um, so in in South America, especially in Bolivia, we have very very colorful. We have a very colorful culture. Not so much in the environment because La Paz is a very brown city, if you will. Um, there's a lot of dust, and there's a very blue sky, and very lovely mountains that are snowed. Um, but the, uh, the actual, um, soil is, is not, uh, you know, the fertile green soil you would find at lower levels, um, towards the ocean. Um, but the color is in the people and, and especially in some of the women, um, the Cholitas and the, and, uh, buildings nowadays in El Alto, which is a, a city that's a sister city to, to um, I almost said white, to La Paz. <laughs> and so people will wear very um, outfits. So like, you know, like 
yellow skirt and a blue uh, manta or shawl and a brown hat and you know it's just it's just very colorful and the arrangements are um, don't translate that well here and I remember I told you a story about the mirror but I will get to that um, so when I moved to uh, Victoria to go to university I started painting like I said uh, you know llamas and cholitas and whatever and I noticed that my props were just kind of thrown back about my my color choices and so I, I figured out through trial and error that I had to adapt my palette to a more um, uh, you know like uh, a contemporary art palette which is a lot more muted in terms of of minimalist, um, well, it was anyways at the time in the 90s, uh, where you would use very little color and it was more about installation and photography and a lot of black and white and some color, but not in the way that I was using it. So I had to adapt, yes. And that was a bit of a, you know, it's, it takes a long time um, to absorb that into your body so that you can um, kind of rearrange those ideas in, in your brain. But then, of course, if you study color, then you start to, it's almost like a, a neutralizing what you have already as a color experience and then relearning it. So color theory, of course, helped a lot. Um, but, even, but even then, uh, when you look at artwork um, in Bolivia versus the artwork in Canada, you do find that those tastes are quite different in terms of the, the approach to color. And I am comfortable in both. But I know that if I um, try to um, approach color in the way that I would like to sometimes, I know for sure the clientele, if you will, uh, would not be all that, I don't know, familiar or um, aesthetically uh, familiar with it and they might not be interested. Um, anyway, it's just different tastes and it's different uh, experiences with color that each country has, of course. South America is very vibrant in its colors. North America, not so much. It's, I don't know what it is. It's a cultural thing, I think. And as an artist, you, you notice those things right away and you know you can adapt your palette um, as needed um, and adopt the tastes of your of the country that you're living in and um, or but be influenced by them I guess I don't see them I don't see it as a negative thing I think it's almost like being bilingual, you know? It's like speaking English is one language, speaking Spanish is a different language. And the same thing with uh, approaches to art. It's just different and they're both beautiful, but they're just different. Yes, I agree. We do acquire this uh, fluidity and we are able to navigate and adapt where we are. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Pilar. So we do have another question from uh, Dina Montoya, and she's asking, what has been your biggest challenge as an artist? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> everything, everything is a challenge as an artist, I think. Um, you know, it's uh, everything takes, sorry, it's just getting really warm in here. Um, the biggest challenge. I think the biggest challenge is patience because, um, you know, uh, and I see this in my students all the time, you want to start and you want to be really good right away. You want to create the best masterpiece there ever was within, you know, five days of learning to draw or paint or whatever. And uh, that is the biggest challenge is to accept that, no, this is a long term learning experience is going to take years for for you to figure out as an artist who you are in, in the first place and what you like because a lot of the time we like to emulate and wonder like yes copying masterworks is 
definitely a good way of learning. But then through all of that, you have to find yourself. And that takes time and it takes commitment and it takes hard work and it takes a whole lot of patience. So I think patience is definitely the biggest challenge. Thank you, Pilar. We do have another question uh, from Maria Jose Pereira. Uh, do you think um, it compromised what you were trying to express in your art? That you, I guess, so I think, um, I think she's asking if you had to compromise uh, what you were, okay. I, I think what she's saying is that because you had to adapt your palette, uh, do you feel that you had to compromise what you were trying to express in art? I think I did at, the, at first, at the beginning, definitely, especially in university, because um, I was from a culture that was vastly different than the university I went to. And my, uh, my background was basically trying to learn to paint. So I was academic. I was trying to figure out how to paint, whereas the university I went to in Victoria, it was all about, you know, you, you're, only, you're supposed to already know how to paint, so now you have to express yourself, you have to find that language. And so in doing that, you are compromising a lot because you have to basically almost pretend that, yeah, okay, sure, I know how to paint, so therefore, my expression is this or my expression is that. So you're forced to, to think in terms that I think are more mature or were at the time for me more mature than I really was as an artist because I was, I was you know, still learning how to, I was still learning technique and I was forced or asked to be a fully developed artist. And that was, you know, you, you definitely have to compromise um, your learning curve. You have to um, become that that artist right away who has a voice, who has a vocabulary. And, uh, you know, I came up with something, but it's not something that stuck because it wasn't really me. It was me trying to, to pretend that I was, you know, this, uh, this whole artist that I still wasn't and I was still far away from being. It took many years after that. Yes, I think it's definitely a, a live venture. And uh, sorry, I'm just getting distracted. I think there's a survey here. And I think Lily also has a question for you. Lily, would you like to um, go ahead and ask yourself? Sure. Uh, you guys are seeing a little uh, uh, poll there. So if you can fill that, it's just one question. Uh, so Pilar, you have been mentioning uh, in some of the, the, your, your students and that you teach. Can you talk a, a little bit about mm -hmm. that work? Uh, so what is it that you teach and, and how does this <coughs> relationship with your students work informs your own work? How, you know, if it one, uh, one thing fits the other? Mm -hmm. um, I find it really challenging to teach while I'm trying to do my own work, um, especially when I was trying to teach more than I do now. <laughs> of course, with COVID, I'm not teaching. But uh, before that, I, it took a while for me to figure out that I could handle um, teaching drawing um, while I do my own work. So I stopped teaching, um, you know, on a regular basis. I stopped teaching painting and I stopped teaching uh, mixed media and just concentrated fully on drawing because I feel that I'm still a student of drawing myself. So it to me, it's really wonderful to present um, very basic ideas of art, like, you know, the, um, the study of light, the study of form and the study of, um, of composition um, from different angles and just in being enriched by it myself because my students they they're wonderful they can they can reflect things back to me that that um, 
that I can I can learn from and be enriched. So I almost see it like a symbiotic relationship, not so much me giving them, they also give me back a lot. So I really actually enjoy teaching drawing um, because of that of that idea. I don't know, it's it's that symbiotic relationship where I'm learning just as much as they are. Great, thank you. Uh, it's still about symbolism. Uh, uh, I, uh, another thing that I was remembering, and we, we touched up in religion very briefly, and I saw some religious symbols in your studio. There is like a Madonna, yeah. there is a cross. Um, <clears throat> a fish is stands for Christ or for God in, right. in Christianism, right? You have that symbol, a very simple, simple symbol of a fish that stands for Christ. Does that, is that something that, that was just like something that you realize afterwards or something that you think? You the salmon you mean? Yeah, if that meaning is something that you 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 uh, wanted to to impart. Uh, no, that was purely coincidental. If yeah, no, it wasn't something that I was focusing on at that moment. Um, I realized later that yeah, that can be a very very much that is a very a very Christian symbol. But I it wasn't why I approached it in the first place. Mind you, I have been fed by religious art all my life because I'm just thinking about my first museum experiences were at um, the uh, National Art Museum in La Paz. And its first three floors or three levels or something, it was all colonial art. So it was uh, mostly religious paintings from, uh, you know, from the pre-colonial times, or not, from the colonial times all the way to um, early 20th century. So, um, of course, all of us artists in, in La Paz, that was our first experience of, of going to see uh, real artwork. It was that museum and it was, um, it was all religious work. Not all, but a, a whole lot of it was religious work. So you pick up on all the symbolism, you pick up on all the, I mean, as you study it, of course, as well with history of art, you, you realize how um, painters, because um, these painters in Bolivia were, uh, a lot of them were Spaniards and they were Italian. Um, friars that had come with the with the caravelas or <laughs> ships or whatever and the the monasteries where they worked um they basically were there to um relate the gospels to the people to the locals and so uh, a lot of the locals then many of them like Melchor Perez de Olguin, would start um, studying under one of these friars and then they would it would become this interesting hybrid of the the uh, colonial or the um, European art from the you know 15th 16th century with the um, with the local uh, vocabulary so it 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 uh, produced a lot of hybrid symbolism, which is very much um, like Bolivian, I would say, symbolism. For example, we have a Madonna that's inside a hill, and that's because the, the Cerro Rico de Potosí, which was the, the mountain in Potosí, this is a different city, which was exploited for gold and silver for centuries, and it's still there um, as gold mines and, and silver mines, but the mines are still colonial looking and very dangerous to walk through. Um, but they've been, you know, pretty much emptied out of their contents. Um, but the Madonna would be integrated into the hill. So you would see the, the painting of the mountain 
and you would see the face of the Madonna and her, both her hands coming out of either side of the mountain. And, and so they, they would, you know, integrate the, the local symbolism with the, the uh, European religious symbolism and it became a, a whole hybrid. Um, and I think that happened all over South America. It just became something different, but it was the same. The same message with Bolivian symbols. Thank you. That makes a that, that makes a, a a lot of sense to me. It, it's uh, there's somebody making a lot of noise out here, so I don't know if I should keep my well got a little better. Somebody with a power tool. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so if we if we don't have any questions for the moment, I think we can keep going with with Mirad. Thank you, thank you. Um, also, I, I don't know, Pilar, there's anything um, in addition that you would like to add before we kind of move towards the end of the call? Um, hmm. uh, about my work, um, I think we touched on everything. Um, yeah, I think, I think, unless there's questions out there, I'm, Oh, there's my studio. <laughs> the one with the fish <laughs> costumes. That that's my old studio. Before I moved to this one, I've moved to many studios. <laughs> Was it all um, at Parker Studios or an entire different location? Uh, no, I had a studio at 901 Main. That was my first studio. Um, and then since then, well, I had one in Kelowna when we lived there, but mostly at Parker. I've had three, three studios at Parker. 1000 Parker Street, sorry everybody. 1000 Parker is a building in Vancouver, in East Vancouver, that houses a lot of um, artists, studios, and craftspeople's um, workshops. So we have furniture makers, painters, sculptors, um you name it there's all sorts of different practices it's a very interesting building it is and that's where Jewelers. i actually uh, encountered your work for the first time so i'm really grateful for that crawl that happens every year there um hopefully for those mm -hmm. that don't live here maybe they can visit and, and do the crawl <laughs> maybe next year when there's hopefully no COVID going this on. year because it'll be virtual anyways probably right so we will let you know, we'll share that information as well. <laughs> well, um, if there is uh, no further questions now, of course you can always reach out to Pilar directly. I will share her Instagram account at the end of the presentation. And uh, well, really Pilar, thank you so much for being a part of this series. I think it's just wonderful to you know, make sense of life, right? Through your art somehow, I think, it, especially it helps me and I'm sure it helps uh, many of us that are here today that, you know, we're curious to see how, what your process was like, uh, how you processed that, um, that movement of coming here from Bolivia and, and, and being like a, like a full-time immigrant here. Um, so that was lovely. Thank you so much. And uh, we will continue this conversation around my, uh, migration. Um, I love how your view uh, is very natural. You, you see migration as a natural act right, as an act that um, both humans and animals um, do. So I think that's just a lovely vision. And uh, next, uh, our next session is going to happen in September. And we are going to, um, it's going to be a complete different approach. Uh, we, so today we looked at painting, at sculpture, uh, mixed media, drawing. And uh, in our next session, we are going to be speaking to a performance artist, Guadalupe Martinez, who is also based in Vancouver. So we are going to sort of um, learn how through her practice, um, she, she lives through her body. And it's also a very, uh, it's a word that collaborates a lot with other people and to explore the notion of belonging, of identity, right? Because I think that's something else that, um, that, that we go through when we, uh, when we live at, at a place that it's not originally our country. 
So that should be interesting. Uh, so please, uh, we will share the links to, uh, to this second session uh, in the chat and also please make sure you follow um, Black's account. Um, I will come back to the slides. So um, there's uh, www.black.ca. I believe that's the right website. Can you just confirm mm -hmm. for, just me, for me, Lily? Or just uh, just asking Lily, who is the executive director of Black, to give us the right uh, <laughs> web website address. So, guys, it's black.ca. Uh, we are also on, on Facebook. Besides, so you are seeing our Instagram account there, but we are uh, also on on Facebook as as black black.ca. And um, you have there on the chat the link to get your Eventbrite tickets to next month's studio visit. Knowing as you as you saw before that we have a couple other a studio visits lined up. So it's, it's a series of four uh, studio visits and we hope to see many of you in, in the upcoming ones. And I would like to talk about this. Uh, thank you for putting the slide up. We are very excited about this workshop series that's starting on, on August 25th, that works on the 25th. So that's a series of four classes about visual storytelling and photography. And we are very excited about having been Felipe Fittipaldi because Felipe is a, an awarded photographer, Brazilian photographer, who has works published in the National Geographic magazine and the New York Times magazine, several other important, important publications. And he was going to to tell us how to build a, a story through photography and on the course of these four uh, uh, classes of the, of the workshop we are going to be able to develop our own, own story and tell that story of, about photo with uh, using photography as the as the medium so I'm going to be participating and doing my own project, and I hope that many of you will, will come to that too. I'm going to uh, put a link to Filippi's workshop also on the chat, right here. So you can learn more and get your ticket. Thank you so, so much, Ellie. Thank you again. Um, for really inviting us, uh, Pilar and I, to be a part of your program. Uh, we love what you're doing with uh, Black. I think um, the Latin American community definitely needs that voice that you're carrying. So thank you for, for having us and being a part of that. So we can't wait to follow uh, the rest of your events online. I'm glad to see that, how we've been adapting to the non-physical events. It's really wonderful. Yeah, I would like also to thank you, Mirat. Thank you so much. This is so good to have you and to have Pilar here. It's our first experience trying something like this. So thank you everybody for showing up. We really hope to see you in, in, in other programs. And I invite you to really go to our website, see a little bit more of what we have been doing. We pivoted all our program to, to, to online and there are some, some exciting programs coming up. The reading group, it's something else that you guys might be interested in participating. And we are doing that with the Latin American uh, uh, department uh, at UBC. So it's the Latin American Studies Department at UBC. So we always have a Latin American professor uh, reading this uh, Latin American stories with us. That's how I, I got to know the Garcia Marquez uh, man with the the long wings and it's so great mm -hmm. when we start making these connections through 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 the program Pilar such a pleasure to have you I uh, thank you so much for opening your doors to to us in into to your wonderful work the wonderful world of your of your birds and and fish thank you so very much yeah. thank you for having me thank you very much Mirad, if you if you are uh, if you don't have uh, any last words before we finish this, or if we don't have anybody else with a, a last minute question, 
I'm going to, to, to wrap up. Yes, just join us for the next event. That's, uh, those, are, those would be my last words and thank you again. <laughs> thank you too. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. We hope to thank see you. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Good Thanks. night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>